I'm pleased to welcome everyone to the third Bristol Myers Squibb Network of Women Grand Rounds. This event was originally planned as part of our company wide celebration of Women's History Month, but like so many other events this year, was postponed due to the pandemic. Although I wish we could be gathering in person, I am thrilled that we're still able to make this possible thanks to the effort of our Be Now team. I also want to give a special thank you to our panelists and to all of you participating today across the globe. I am excited about the progress we're making, but there's no doubt we still have important work to do and we can use your help to get it done. So if you aren't already a member, I strongly encourage you to join Be Now. We have 30 chapters across the globe and no shortage of opportunities for you to get involved. This goes for all the men out there as well. In fact, engaging more men in the advancement of women is one of the biggest opportunities we have to meaningfully accelerate gender diversity at all levels of BMS. With that, I wanna thank you all again for your participation today, and I hope you find this program valuable and rewarding. Kristen Hege will moderate the discussion. For those of you who do not know Kristen, she joined BMS last year by way of Celgene. She spent the previous 10 years at Celgene building the Early Clinical Development Organization and is now the SVP of Early Clinical Development, Hematology, Oncology, and Cell Therapy. In addition to her work at BMS, Dr. Hege is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, where she continues to see patients with blood cancers weekly. In 2015, Dr. Hege was recognized by Fierce Biotech as one of the top 12 women in biopharma and in 2020 by San Francisco Business Times as one of the most influential women leaders in Bay Area business. With that, I'm pleased to introduce Kristen. Thank you, Chris, for the kind introduction. I'd like to review the goals and objectives of the program today. We're going to focus on female mentorship and how it has contributed to career success and advancement of medicine. We also want to propose and evaluate opportunities for advancing and sponsoring women in healthcare. I thought I would start with a few of my personal stories about being mentored myself and then mentoring others. Probably my strongest mentor, Dr. Steve Sherwin. I, I met him when I was a fellow at UCSF and he was my attending physician at the county hospital. I was taking the bus to work and he was nervous about that because it wasn't in a great neighborhood. So he started driving me to and from the hospital and we got to talking about my career aspirations. I ultimately ended up deciding to go to his small biotech company where he worked when he wasn't volunteering at the hospital. I spent 14 years there and he was known as the cookie man to my children. I've stayed in touch with Steve for now over 25 years. And ironically, he left his faculty position at UCSF. And when he decided to rejoin after the company he founded uh, came to an end, I had to write him a letter of recommendation. On the other end, I, you know, I have a mentee story that I love. I, I, I had a college intern one summer who worked with me. We stayed in touch. I, kind of encouraged her to join <clears throat> biotech right after college. She did an internship program at Genentech. I encouraged her to consider graduate school. She's now a graduate student at the University of Washington. So how do those mentor-mentee relationships work? Well, at the beginning when she was a summer student and I was a busy site head, well, we found times for one-on-ones running together. We both enjoyed running. I then took her on her first backpacking trip and since then, she's backpacked around the globe. Um, <clears throat> we've stayed in touch for years. I've written her many letters of recommendation. And just yesterday, I got a thoughtful gift from her in the mail, two rolls of small duct tape uh, that I was missing from my backpacking kit. So, you know, I think the best mentor-mentee relationships have a component of professional connection and a very personal connection. And so I would encourage everyone to find those relationships in their lives. So I wanna turn over now to our panelists and let each of our panelists uh, introduce themselves and then we will move to the panel discussion. So let's start with Carrie Hirsch. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's very nice to be here. And I would like to first thank uh, BMS for inviting me to this very important program. 
Uh, my name is Carrie Hirsch. I am an attending physician at the Cleveland Clinic, Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in sunny Las Vegas. Uh, here I am a multiple sclerosis specialist um, where I am primarily seeing folks with MS and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder and other neuroimmunological disorders. I completed my training at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland uh, where I completed an adult neurology residency program in 2013, a neuroimmunology fellowship at the Mellon Center for Treatment and Research uh, between 2013 and 2015. During my time out there, I also completed a master's degree in clinical research at the Case Western Reserve University. Um, again, thank you so much everyone for allowing me to be here today and I look forward to the program. Carrie, and why don't we move on to Nina Shaw? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nina Shaw, coming to you also from the West Coast. Uh, I'm an associate professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. So I do bump into Kristen um, in our heme clinic. But um, before this, um, I'm actually from the East Coast, um, and so this is a good time for me. But um, I prior to being at University of California, San Francisco, was at MD Anderson, where I spent 10 years there developing an interest in multiple myeloma and cellular therapy. And that's where I met my mentor, EJ Schball, who you'll hear about later uh, today. And now I focus clinically on multiple myeloma, but my research focus is really on novel immunotherapies. And it's just been a wonderful thing for me to be involved uh, with events with BMS and also working with Kristen in the cell therapy uh, development space. So I'm really excited to be here and share and learn from all of you. Uh, how about Tanaya Singh? Thank you. Um, I'm Tonya Singh and I'm from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. I uh, am a general cardiologist and I run a private practice here in St. Louis, which is completely independent. Um, and I am uh, really interested in taking care of my patients um, and all their general cardiac problems. Um, I have the uh, opportunity to work with many of my partners who are um, interested in intervention and peripheral vascular work. Um, and we uh, are able to provide our patients with everything they need and under one location. Um, I also chair the um, American College of Cardiology, Women in Cardiology Council. Um, and I have the opportunity of working with women cardiologists um, in the US and all across the globe. Um, and it has been a fantastic opportunity to get to know um, many women, uh, many very bright women from all over the world, as well as collaborate with them. And I am really excited about being here and looking forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. And Tina Twyman? I'm Tina Twyman, St. Thickler. I'm a clinical trial physician in early clinical oncology, so Kristen's group. I've been at BMS now for about a year and a half, and prior to that, I was on faculty at UPenn, um, where I did mainly research looking at mouse models of IO and radiation therapy, and also uh, saw patients. So my name is Dr. Shika Jane. I'm a hematology oncology physician at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I'm, uh, I focus on GI oncology, and I'm also the director of communication strategies for the Department of Medicine and the direct, associate director of digital innovation for our cancer center. Um, I'm also the founder and chair of the Women in Medicine Summit, and I want to thank uh, BMS for inviting me to speak on this important topic with this fantastic panel of women. Great. Well, now that we have the sound working, let's move into the panel discussion. We'll start with Tanya. What does mentorship look like for a practicing physician? In what ways do you view differences between men and women in soliciting or participating in mentorship? I think uh, mentorship is important for us during all phases of our careers, whether we are medical students or just starting out in our careers or, you know, um, mid-career like me, I've been in practice for about 17 years or late, even later. Um, the discussions we have with our mentors are very based on our life situation and our need that we have at that moment. And always remember, mentorship is a two-way process. Um, it is a great benefit to the mentor and the mentee. Um, 
having a mentor can help you overcome a setback. It can help you manage stress. It can help you get a big picture view that allows to see your path clearly. And again, this remains important whether you're um, in private practice, in academia, or even in industry. Um, they can help us deal with difficult situations and colleagues at work um, uh, by providing a safe space to discuss this. They can help us navigate the so many unwritten rules that we don't even know about. Um, we can have honest and critical conversations with them that lead to insight into our own strengths and weaknesses, which then allow us to um, you know, deal with our issues better. They help build confidence, they help promote inclusion, and again, these, like I said, are valuable at all stage of, stages of our careers. Now, studies have shown that men and women both have access to mentors, and women sometimes are more mentored than men, but there um, is a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. So um, there's a saying that says women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. Um, and we can talk some more about that in the, in the later part of the discussion, but um, I feel like that is an important um, issue that leads to how we interact with our mentors and what we expect from our mentors. Um, it also seems like men have more access to mentoring opportunities that are more informal, like golfing sessions and you know connections after work that women don't always have access to or are able to use. Um, so like I said, I believe um, a mentor is an extremely important person. Um, we need, uh, we may need more than one kind of mentor. Um, we may have several mentors at the same time who provide us mentorship in different aspects of our lives. Um, and I would always like to say we need to help see if we can turn our mentors into sponsors as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Nina, uh, tell us about your experience as a mentor, mentee to Dr. E.J. Small. You know, some of the younger audience may not know her, but she was quite a force or is quite a force in the field at MD Anderson. Um, how did that impact you? Yeah, um, I totally agree that the mentor-mentee relationship is so important. And I was very fortunate enough to meet my primary mentor um, almost 10 years ago, uh, AJ Spall, who was a leader in the field of cellular therapy. And one of the reasons that I chose, well, that we chose each other, I guess, as a mentor-mentee relationship is that I really did my homework to interview someone. And I, I told myself, I'm going to have a female mentor. And she happened to be there and was in a field that I was interested in. What this mentor-mentee relationship meant to me is everything. Everything that I am now in my career, I can somehow at some point trace back to her. And the reason that relationship worked was because it was a two-way street, as Tanya just mentioned. Uh, when she needed me to deliver, I did. And when I needed her to support, she did. But as Tanya also mentioned, it was not just about mentoring. It was about sponsorship. And just by watching her, I could see, even if she didn't actually in that moment actually actively sponsor me, let's just say we were in a meeting, I could see the examples of how she could be heard, she could be seen. And then when it came to places where she had an opportunity to let me be heard and be seen or to push me in the direction of that, she would do it actively. And that's a skill I learned from her and I've now taken to my next mentees. And one example of this is we were at a um, conference or at a meeting for a, um, a clinical trials group, a, a cooperative group. And I was very interested in this trial and I had a lot of experience um, in cellular therapy, but I I was young and she I will never forget this at the end of the meeting just basically pushed me up next to her and to the senior people she said well Nina will be one of your co-PIs right and she just said it and that was the end of it and um, you need sometimes somebody to give you the confidence that you don't have and I, 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 I got that from her and learning that from her I have now pushed for my mentees when they may not have the confidence because I feel that sometimes you just need someone to, to give you that so I, I think that I've benefited from having a woman role model as a mentor from a scientific aspect from career development aspect but also from a sponsorship aspect um, and there are so many multiple dimensions that she contributed to my life and, and I look up to her still, even though I'm not at the same institution as her. And I think that really provides for the most fulfilling mentor-mentee relationship, similar to what Kristen was saying. That's great, Nina. It sounds like you've had a great opportunity to have a fabulous female mentor even, you know, even more of a rarity. Tina, 
can you you've made the transition from an academic uh, position to an industry position. So you have an interesting perspective here. Can you tell us how your experience in pharma compares with that in academia from the standpoint of mentorship and sponsorship? And what initiatives could be effective in pharma? What could pharma do better in this regard? Uh, thank you, Kristen. No pressure at all, right? Um, and so my experience in pharma is very, or in academia, is very similar to what you've heard. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, and maybe it was unique to me, but when I actually started, my contract actually had a mentor, two mentors in my case listed, as well as an advisory team. And that's something that hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, and so my advisory team were the people who could give me just factual advice. And so what qualifications would be needed to excel in a position? Whereas my mentor um, actually knew me and we had a, a relationship and there was trust. And so that's the person I would go to if I wanted to say, should I apply for this position or am I competitive for this grant? Um, and so we did make that distinction um, between advisors and mentors. And then obviously we had sponsors as well. Um, and mentoring was expected and required literally to be promoted. You had to have some sort of mentoring and or, and or teaching experience. Um, and so it was really ingrained in the culture. Um, I should preface this by saying I've absolutely loved my time at BMS and it's been very positive, but I do think that my intro um, was unique. And so the first thing is when I came to BMS, I was assigned a manager. And I remember thinking that's odd. Um, that I'm not being told about a mentor. Um, and I wasn't naive enough to think that they accidentally were saying manager and really meant mentor. Um, but I was lucky in that my manager is absolutely amazing. Uh, and so she immediately assigned me a peer buddy. Um, she assigned me with, to have one-on-ones with literally everyone in early clinical development, as well as numerous people through other cross-functional areas. Um, she met with me weekly. Um, she sent out one of those announcements that we get, um, and that prompted other people to actually sign up for one-on-ones with me. Um, and then she actually encouraged me to be active in the PBRGs, and she basically helped me establish a network at BMS, which then led to me finding those advisors and mentors and sponsors uh, that I would eventually need. Um, and so, what do I think BMS can do better? That's a very weighty question when you work here. Um, I think the first thing is standardizing that onboarding process. Uh, mine, I think, was amazing. Um, but from speaking with other people, it seems like my experience may have actually been unique and not the norm. Um, and I'm sure other people have had other great experiences. Um, and we could really come up with a great plan on how to help people establish that network, especially in the time of COVID and us doing everything through teams, it might not be as easy to develop that network. Um, and then my other suggestion would be looking at our company goals, which include this um, embedding the people strategy um, and how are we actually implementing that? Um, I must admit, I've only heard about mentorship and sponsorship through these PBRGs. Um, so I'm part of being now involved. Um, I've never actually talked about it with my managers. Um, that doesn't mean it's being done. And so, and how are we, let me say, acknowledging those who are amazing mentors and sponsors? Um, and so, are we, is there any way to acknowledge them? I don't know. Um, and so those are my suggestions. Uh, so, so Carrie. You know, you are the co-chair of the Abstract Review Committee, a member of the Board of Governors of the Consortium of MS Centers, and you've had the opportunity to lead courses and roundtables promoting women in MS. How do you think these initiatives have promoted discussions and actions to reduce gender disparities within the field of MS? Well, thank you so much for the question, Kristen, and I, I actually just want to uh, voice to the entire panel that this has been extremely inspiring and I'm actually getting a whole lot I'm um, just listening to all of these wonderful women in these important fields of medicine so I'm, I'm very privileged to be here 
Um, historically, in the field of neurology, there's been an underrepresentation of women, um, especially in the field of MS and related disorders. And I have been very fortunate in, in the fact that during my fellowship, um, I had a very important mentor in my life. Um, she was my preceptor. Her name is Dr. Mary Rensel. And from the very beginning of my fellowship program uh, up until today, she has been a key advocator um, in making sure that I am developing and growing in my career. She has always mentored and sponsored me. And um, not all of my colleagues have had the same experiences. And so part of my role in the Consortium of MS Centers, which is a nonprofit organization um, that has uh, key roles in education, research, and patient advocacy, I wanted to make sure that our voices in the women's space were being heard, uh, simply because there continues to be quite a bit of gender disparity among MS healthcare providers in this space, um, even though uh, in the MS population, the uh, proportion of folks who have MS is three to one female to male. And so we wanna make sure that our voices are being heard and we are being appropriately acknowledged, not as important key leaders, but also as researchers. Um, so in the CMSC, we have actually uh, put together a variety of different programs at our annual meetings, uh, some of them being uh, didactic presentations, um, talking about uh, uh, physician burnout, um, unique opportunities for women, but then of course unique challenges uh, for women uh, that maybe our male constituents are not also um, experiencing during their careers. But then we also wanted to make uh, take it a step further, make sure that we were um, hearing the voices of our female constituents, make sure that they were being engaged. And that's where we started having roundtable uh, sessions at these annual meetings and starting to develop a mentorship uh, program between uh, mentors and mentees. So those who might be um, uh, more advanced in their career, mid-career, late career, and those who are early career. And now for our upcoming program in 2021, we aim to have a program that is far more interactive, where we're going to have a space for uh, actually having mock presentations and mock scenarios of how to have a voice in the boardroom, how to have that five minute elevator speech, um, how to advocate for yourself, uh, um, how to uh, put together um, uh, um, uh, a, a program, program development, um, and then of course, um, how to advocate for yourself during interviews. So we're hoping that this will be more engaging, more interactive, and of course, more practical for women in growing their careers. That's great. Thank you so much. Chica, as a founder of the Women in Medicine Summit, what mentorship strategies have you implemented to aid in your mission of advancing women? <laughs> So I will tell you the pandemic has completely changed the way we're mentoring. I mean, as all of you know, we're having a virtual conference right now. Our Women in Medicine Summit was virtual. So I think that there's been a lot of innovation and creative ways that we found to really enrich these mentorship uh, relationships and opportunities. One thing that I have done personally, I've gotten much more uh, I'm much more likely to text my mentees than I was before. I've set up Zoom meetings with them. Um, we've set up the ones who are in town. We've set up socially distanced coffee, but it's required a lot more planning than it has in the past. In the past, I feel like it was a little bit more informal and we weren't as worried about making sure that we had that continuous connection and that we had that set time. Now with the pandemic, I've been much more cognizant of making sure that I have a set time once a month to meet with my mentees and to make sure that we are connecting and also just checking in on them periodically to make sure they're doing okay mentally with everything that's going on. You know, um, you had talked initially, Kristen, about some amazing mentor-mentee relationships you've had. And my most impactful mentors in my career and my life are the ones who I have a very, very strong professional and personal relationship with. And so I'm trying to implement that now with my mentees as I help 
kind of groom them for their future careers. Um, you know, I've found that sending text messages periodically just to check in, not even a formal call or a formal Zoom meeting, but just sending in a text message and saying, hey, how are you doing this week? I know you had an exam coming up or I know you wanted to see your family for your birthday, but you're not able to because of the pandemic. And I think that's one thing that I didn't really realize the importance of until this pandemic, just checking in on the mental health of our mentees and making sure that they're doing okay and that they're navigating through this pandemic in uh, in a way that that is mentally okay for them because many of them aren't able to see their families or their friends. And that's not something we had to, I think, worry about in the past as much. Um, I will also say that having these mentor sponsor relationships have become key. And through the summit, we found really amazing ways to not only mentor some of the attendees and some of the people who signed up for the official mentorship sessions, but also we found great ways for sponsorship. Um, for example, we have found ways to get medical students who are volunteers uh, who are scribing for the event, we're going to find ways to get them published. So they'll have academic papers that come out of the volunteer work that they did at the summit. So being really innovative and find creative ways where your mentor-mentee relationship can result in sponsorship opportunities. Um, one thing that I teach all of my mentees is the work that you're doing, you should try to find ways to get three different things out of all of the work you're doing. So if you're doing research on a project, try to get an academic paper out of it, try to get an op-ed out of it, and then also if you're able to get a media appearance out of it, depending on what the research is. So being really creative in finding ways that your mentees can get their names out there in a time where they're not going to necessarily be meeting as many people, but all of these opportunities have opened up in the digital space where they can get their names out there and you can sponsor them to get opportunities that might not have been available a year ago when so many things had not transitioned to the online space. Tanya, that is great advice, and um, you brought up a few of these summits. I, I would encourage folks to seek out forums, you know, where you can expand your network, especially if you're interested in forums around female leadership. You know, one thing I wanted to highlight, I co-chaired with a number of other folks from the Society of Immunotherapy of Cancer, SIFTI, uh, a women's leadership conference for early career women in science and medicine, you know, and, and the... The faculty were sort of late, I call myself, late, you know, late career women in science and medicine. We had the first one last summer. It was by, you know, invitation only. So the young women had to sign up. And then, I mean, it was like an NIH grant review process. We went through and scored everybody, and we eventually picked our 100 um, participants. But that was a wonderful conference. It was the first time in my career I sat in a room with, you know, 100 women. And, and we all want men as co-sponsors, but it's just so rare, I think, for women to sit in rooms with all women. Um, I, unfortunately, because of COVID, we had two more of those women's conferences planned this summer, and we ended up canceling them and not going virtual. But we're going to do it again next year. So I would encourage people to look out for those forums. Nina, you just, you know, were part of a wonderful women's leadership forum that you participated me, uh, you invited me to join. There are many of these forums out there where we can all expand our network, get advice um, from, from other women, and I would encourage folks to seek those out. So, so let's go back to Tanya. You, know, you have strong views on sponsorship versus mentorship, thanks to your vast experience as chair of National Women in Cardiology section for the American Cardi College of Cardiology. Could you speak about that? So as I said before, you know, it's uh, we, as women, we are often mentored, um, and sometimes we are over-mentored and under-sponsored. So we need both mentors and sponsors. And sometimes they can be the same person, but sometimes they may be different people. So one of the, uh, you know, I, a lot of people reach out to me. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter through direct message on social media, or if I meet someone at a meeting um, to interact. And occasionally I'll have somebody say, oh, can you be my sponsor? Can you be my mentor? And, you know, that's that's a big ask. It's like, you know, do you want to date me permanently for years? So I think that before we um, do something like that, it's important to follow a, a certain path. And this is just my recommendation. Um, and so what I, I encourage my um, the people I interact with to do. 
um, is before you get into a serious relationship about being a mentor or a sponsor, let's try to get to know the person before asking them. You know, everyone who is in a position of power may not be the best fit for you, um, whether it's a personality fit or a career fit. So I think just um, keeping an open mind and trying to meet as many people as you can um, and trying to get to know them a little bit and then using that process to kind of uh, figure out who you want to um, interact with in the future. Um, and then if you do want to um, ask someone to be a mentor or a sponsor, start by asking something specific. So if you meet them at a meeting, you could say, you know, I'm really interested in this project you're doing. Can I participate in some way? How can I be of help? Uh, which then allows you to work with them, which then allows you to see if they are, a, you know, the kind of person that you want to learn from um, and go from there. Um, if you do decide that you want to make the relationship more formal or, um, you know, you want to go further, um, I would recommend that, um, you know, set up a small, short meeting, a five to 10 minute meeting um, in the previous world, we could do that in person, but now sometimes it's easier because you could do it over the telephone or you could do it um, via Zoom. Um, and then when you come to this meeting well prepared, um, be on time, be prepared. And, and um, one of the things that I tell people to prepare for the meeting is use um, this thing called the 4S method, which is um, have a story, um, which tell them your story in short, um, tell them what you're doing now, which is your situation. Um, tell them about your self-awareness factors, like what do you think of yourself as your strengths and what you perceive as your strengths. And then um, tell them what skills you have and how you can build on them further with their help. Um, and by doing this, you're able to give the other person a general idea of who you are, you know, what, what you're doing, what your skills are, um, and then it gives, it allows them to do more to help you. Um, again, like I said, always be on time, always be prepared, and then find ways to exist in their world that does not require any assistance for them. So if you're fortunate enough to work in a department where uh, you're looking for someone to be your mentor, um, just interacting with them, you know, frequently, um, and then trying to do things that would, you know, bring you to their attention and would help them as well. Um, also remember, be willing to trust and learn because this is why you're reaching out to this person. Um, and as, um, Nina said before, um, you know, just being able to, um, continue to do that, um, you know, consistently, um, so much from your, by being in your mentor's presence, you learn how they deal with situations, you learn how they mentor and sponsor others. And, and that's really very um, uh, significant things. And finally, you know, remember mentors advise, sponsors act. So um, sponsors go out there and talk about you. They um, get you um, to the front of the line. Um, they stick their necks out for you in many ways. So when you do have a sponsor, make sure that you work hard on their behalf um, and hold up your end of the bargain. Um, also, you know, you can be a mentor and sponsor at any uh, time in your career. So um, it's important to remember you don't have to become a senior or be middle or late in your career to be a mentor or a sponsor. Um, you can you can do that um, throughout your throughout the process. Um, and there's always much learning to be had for everyone involved. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're going to um, spend the time with someone, also look to see if you can be their sponsor along with their mentor. Tanya, that's great advice. I especially like your recommendation to come with a specific question. You know, sometimes people will reach out to you that you don't know very well and say, will you be my mentor? And that's a very hard question to answer when there's no background or you're not exactly sure what areas that person is seeking mentorship. When somebody comes with specific questions, can I speak to you about how you made this career decision or about how you balance work and life or, or you know, whatever it is, how, you know, how you establish your own mentoring relationships. It focuses the conversation. And I think for, for folks, like you really need to build a relationship first 
So you need to take that time and, as you said, make it a win-win. You know, for me, if anybody wants to go backpacking in the high Sierras, you know, you've got 24 hours a day of my undivided attention, uh, which is was the test that I made for my college summer intern of part of the internship program. Yes, it was about science and medicine, but it was four days in the wilderness. And it was those four days in the wilderness that they all remember. Um, so, so let's get back to Nina. You know, in your field, do, do women have difficulty finding mentors and mentees? Um, yeah, I think this is one of the most common questions I get from women who are, for example, fellows or junior faculty. You know, how do I find a mentor and can I find a woman mentor? By definition and just by statistics, women are a lot at the bottom level right now. I'd say in medicine, I'll speak for medicine. I don't know about industry. But then when you come to the higher levels, it seems to be a lot of men. And there are various reasons that we can talk about in another setting. But what that means is that in the leadership field there or in the leadership levels, there are fewer opportunities to find a woman mentor. But that doesn't mean that all is lost and it doesn't mean that you can't develop as a woman in your field. As you said, Kristen, there are plenty of men who are willing to mentor a woman and it has nothing to do with if they're a man or woman. I, I enjoyed having a woman mentor, uh, but, but it wasn't always statistically likely that was going to happen. That being said, if you find a person who is a woman who you think would be a wonderful mentor, maybe that person isn't in your field, for example, uh, maybe they're in a different department or they do a different type of job, uh, but you feel that you could learn something from her. It is worth it to go and ask for um, a meeting with a specific ask. I think this um, 4S phenomenon that Tanya just talked about is so important uh, because everybody's time is valuable and you have to to be able to do that. If you're going to seek out someone who is a, to be your mentor, whether they're a woman or a man, the most important thing that you can do is know yourself. And this issue of transparency, which is sometimes really hard for us because the four S's that Tanya talked about will not be the same today as they might be in four years or four years from now, because of course your life is going to change and you'll have different things that you want and different things that are going on in the outside of your life. So those things are, are changing. It's important for you to know those things, be honest with yourself about those things before you go to find a mentor and ask her time or his time, because those things, it will help you to have a more fruitful discussion and a more fruitful relationship. If you cannot find someone who is a woman that you'd love to have as a mentor, for example, like I said, it's really important not just to find whether it's a man or a woman, but to find someone who's going to respect those four S's about you. Um, and I think if you can, can know yourself and bring to the conversation those elements, you will find a fruitful relationship, whether it's a man or a woman. Um, I encourage people, as Kristen also said, to seek out these conferences that bring women together and the women that tend to attend these very much like to support other women, like to sponsor other women. I've gotten messages from people that I, I'm not necessarily connected with at my institution who say, hey, would you mind talking over the phone? And I'm always willing to do that, even if it's to help them sort out some career decision, et cetera. There are always people willing to help you. Life will not come to you. You have to come to life. So it's great to ask for these opportunities, look for them, and actually take action on them. That's great, Nina. And that did just remind me after the leadership conference you invited me to, one of the young women did reach out to me to get some advice. So she said my career story resonated with her, my sort of hybrid career in academia and industry. You know, she'd been brainstorming a lot of ideas about her own career and, you know, she wanted to chat and, and get advice. That could be a very fruitful discussion for us. Because, um, you know, she has some industry and alternative, interest in alternative career paths. So, you know, if you hear somebody at a meeting or a conference like this and it grabs you for some reason, don't be afraid to just drop an email. You know, something you said resonated with me. I'd love to talk to you about it further. That's the beginning of a relationship. Um, so, so moving on, Tina, what advice would you give your fellow colleagues at BMS who are looking for mentors and or sponsors? And then specifically, I'd love to ask you, it's very hard for us to find people outside of our normal network. Do you have any advice how we can reach beyond our normal networks, which are full of people just like us, to find mentors or sponsors that bring a different perspective? Well, maybe I'll actually answer that one 
first. Um, and so I think the PBRGs and be now in bold for whatever the PBRG actually stands for, um, have been very helpful for me for reaching outside of my network. Um, because you're right, we know what we know and we know who we know. And it's definitely not e any easier um, now communicating through teams and not bumping into people um, in PPK. Um, and so I, I think that's probably one of the highlights of this. Um, especially in the virtual world. Um, maybe that's the strength. Um, other advice, uh, I've been sitting here thinking, trying to remember how many mentors and sponsors I've had that have been women and or minorities. And I would say it's probably in the single digits. Um, definitely none within my research field of interest prior to joining BMS. Um, and I appreciated that this was gonna be an issue very early on. Um, and so I accepted that I was going to have to have multiple mentors. Um, so I had my research mentors, I had mentors that I asked about work-life balance, and then the mentors for work-life balance changed pre and post family uh, starting. And so um, I, yeah, be open-minded um, when you're searching for mentors and sponsors. Um, and with that, as Kristen has mentioned, we need to look outside of our functional areas. Um, and have multiple mentors um, that you feel comfortable with going to about different issues. Um, it's highly unlikely that you'll find your doppelganger um, who can answer all of your questions. Um, and if you do, please find one for me too. Um, I recommend many of those one-on-ones, as I mentioned. I, I feel like that's really helped me develop a network. Um, and more importantly, here in the world, even post-COVID actually, uh, with us now being a global company, um, we're going to have to become adept at using teams to maintain these networks um, because it will be hopefully more than just your site location. Um, people throughout the call have mentioned that mentorship requires some sort of relationship and I completely agree with that. I think it actually requires trust um, if I'm going to open up and if we're really going to get to know each other um, and that requires time and so I actually sometimes set reminders for myself um, and it, it's literally just a name and it's a check for me have I actually been in contact with that person and obviously when you're on site maybe you had lunch with that person last week or you guys had a meeting together um, and it's uh, completely unnecessary but it should be a gut check have I actually um, touched base with my mentors given them an update on how I'm doing um, even if I don't have any questions. And I feel like that's part of being a good mentee, following up with your mentor. You know what, you gave me this great advice and this is the outcome um, so that they can learn as well. Uh, and then finally about being a good mentee, um, I agree with coming prepared, um, have an agenda, have a plan uh, because yes, there's nothing more frustrating than to feel like you've wasted a half an hour of your day. Um, and then I trying to, I think Nina might have mentioned it, but making sure that you exceed everyone's expectations if someone sponsored you, um, because they are using their personal capital um, to put you up in front of whatever audience. And so make sure you do a good job and make sure you thank them for all of their effort. Um, and I think that's it. I think we've had a lot of great advice over this past hour. Great, thanks to Carrie. We have two more questions. We're going to try to race through them and get to the Q and A. Carrie, you know, recently you've worked with the MSAA to develop and provide COVID nineteen MS patient education. How has this pandemic impacted your patient conversations and treatment counseling, and how has the pandemic affected you professionally? Sure. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to have a conversation uh, nowadays without COVID-19 uh, being brought to, to the, uh, the forefront of the conversation. Um, yes, I've been working uh, very closely with the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, which is another nonprofit organization um, that um, essentially engages patients in uh, education and is a wonderful advocate for our MS community and their care partners. Um, currently, I am the chair of the Healthcare Advisory Council, and in that role, I've been co-moderating uh, COVID-19 
uh, Q&A sessions uh, nearly on a monthly basis since March of this year. And I've actually become humbled uh, during this time period because um, our patients in the MS space are so insightful. They have um, extraordinary knowledge in MS and immunotherapies and how it may impact their overall health. And I've actually learned a lot from not only the participants in these COVID-19 discussions, but also in my clinic as well. Um, and I've actually learned a lot from what our patients uh, have to say to us. Um, we have to understand that this is very much a moving target. We are learning every day. Uh, we have registries and uh, very smart scientists who are looking at the risks of COVID-19 with our disease-modifying therapies, which many of them are immunosuppressive therapies. And, um, you know, it's just been such a wonderful learning environment. And I really do appreciate uh, the give-take relationship that we do have with our patients. And as it relates to mentorship, um, you know, yes, it is so important to make sure that you are trying to find that, that partner with you who uh, can follow you in your career and provide not only professional um, um, you know, information and advice, but, you know, also be able to connect on a personal level. I feel the same way about my patients. Your patients are going to be your strongest advocates. Patients talk. And if you are able to hold trust with them and be able to be their partner, not only um, on a professional level, but also be able to connect with them uh, maybe on a more personal level, um, they are going to sing your praises. So I do find that it's very helpful, not only on a professional level with colleagues, but also with patients as well. And this will open up for, you know, very um, constructive and fruitful relationships moving forward with the patient population. Personally, professionally, COVID-19 has affected all of us. Um, I've had to learn how to be very flexible and creative in how I uh, chair and co-chair uh, programs and conferences, um, learning how to have a scientific platform session on my research, um, essentially through a virtual platform like, where it's like I'm talking to myself. Uh, so really flexibility and how to uh, be comfortable in uh, being creative about how I put myself forward. Great, thank you. Well, we have our first question from the audience, which I think is an important one. And so as a result, I want everyone to just give maybe one sentence response to this question, which is as a male leader, what should I be sensitive to as I mentor women? Just like that top line, one sentence each, starting with, um, starting with Tanya. Thanks. Um, I think you should be aware of the need to mentor them and ask them um, specifically what exact um, space would they like, um, you know, help with so that to be make it more specific and actionable. Great. Nina, what should men be sensitive to when they mentor women? I think it's hard sometimes, but just to be sensitive to your own biases, because you may think a certain, uh, just because someone's a woman, you may not even realize it, but you might think that she has certain priorities, which she may not have, um, and that might cloud the way you choose to mentor her or what you think that she's capable of. Great. Tina. So I'm actually going to build off of what Nina just said and question why you're mentoring and not sponsoring. What can you actually do to promote that mentee um, and do more than just mentoring? And Carrie? Just being aware of her career goals and where she wants to grow in her career. Great, and Sheikha? One thing we know is that women often don't get that feedback, that objective feedback when they have these mentor sponsor relationships. So as you have the relationship and as you develop it, make sure you're not just giving subjective feedback, you're also giving objective feedback so that they can improve if there are areas that they need to improve on um, and give them that objective uh, feedback to help them become better at whatever they need to be doing. And I guess my advice would be don't jump to any assumptions about what your female, you know, mentees might be seeking versus your male mentees. But at the same time, constantly ask yourself, 
is there any unconscious bias at play? If I, if I am true to myself, am I treating my female mentee differently? Even if that is, well, if this was a guy, maybe I, you know, asked him to go on a 100-mile bike ride, but because it's a woman, probably shouldn't be interested in that. Like, just check yourself in terms of your assumptions. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. We'll go to the second question. How can we in pharma partner with mentoring efforts for women in medicine, both academia and private practice? So how can we do more, BMS, for, you know, to... to sponsor your activities in academia? Maybe just a, a, a few people can answer this one. I don't think we need everybody to. Just jump in. Uh, I This is a, I'm going to jump in because this is a big thing for me. Uh, Pharma has been wonderfully supportive of these, uh, both BMS and other companies, both by, like, for example, they sponsor, uh, not necessarily BMS, but other companies have sponsored events at conferences, which are just women focused in my disease group. And we've had a mentorship group arise from that. And then, of course, a lot of Pharma has sponsored leads, so I'm very thankful. But I think that for me, <clears throat> and I've talked to Kristen about this, I really think Pharma can help women by having a very um, objective way that they decide li leads on their multi-center trials that every trial should be one woman, one man, one woman, one man. There's enough to go around. It shouldn't be the same person. If this was this woman this time, it can be another woman the next time. We need to increase the diversity much as ASCO and ASH and other medical societies have done to make sure there's a different person. It's not the same person or the same gender at the podium. No, Nina, that's, I was that's a great um, comment. I I wanted to follow up on that. You reached out to me, it was perhaps a year ago, and said that, you know, ASCO was trying to tackle the issue of why are there so few women on the podium at the annual meeting and, and, and you know, people of color in general. Uh, and part of the discussion was, well, it's because the lead investigators on a clinical trial are the ones who stand up at the podium. Well, who picks the lead investigators on a clinical trial? Well, typically it's the industry who's, you know, who's sponsoring the trial. So that caused us to kick off an initiative at BMS that was already beginning to get underway to explore our diversity metrics in clinical investigators. And as you might imagine, they are lopsided. And now to actively pursue, you know, ask of things that we can do to try to increase the diversity in clinical investigators, including lead clinical investigators, which of course means stepping down from what we call the key opinion leaders in the field to the next generation of investigators. And that will take time, but I completely, you know, re that resonates with me because we just, we need to step back and think instead of just doing what we've always done and going back to the same investigators over and over, you know, how do we increase the diversity, it is that, that uh, diversity. And, and that's about sponsorship, you know, which is, People in academia putting it back on the academic, academic side, you know, for those more senior investigators to say, I don't need to be an investigator on this study. I'd like to hand that off to my colleagues. So I think we can really work together to provide these sponsoring opportunities to allow sort of that next generation, a more diverse pool in that next generation to elevate up to those senior leadership positions, which gets them podium presentations at ASCO and ASH and other cardiology forum, um, I, I do think a partnership is very important. Uh, so I think if I, if I could say something real quick, Kristen, I was also yeah. going to add, in addition to um, um, the clinical trials and steering committees, which I absolutely agree, we need to advocate for women key opinion leaders, but also um, to be mindful of what your advisory board invitation list looks like. So um, ideally, you'll want to see 50% women, 50% gentlemen at your advisory board meetings as well. Yeah, no, that is important. And in conferences, invited speakers at conferences. So I recently received an invitation to speak at an immuno-oncology conference, and I looked at the, you know, a list of speakers, and 10 to 1, they were men. So I immediately reached out to the conference organizers and said, you know, I might be interested in speaking at your conference, but, you know, your diversity and gender balance is very discouraging. And they immediately, of course, reached out to me and they apologized and everything they were trying to do and, you know, let us send a reporter to interview you. We're going to do a feature article. So I, I just, if we all highlighted, 
you know, sort of the elephant in the room. If someone, you know, if you're at a level where you are being invited to speak at conferences, look at the diversity in the panel speakers and, and, and call them on it. You know, I might speak at your conference, but only if you bring in more women and speakers of color. Um, so I, I think there are things that we can all do, this is, you know, about sponsorship. And, you know, I have some ideas for you. Why don't you invite the following 10 women or the following 10 people of color? And usually they're very receptive. So I, I think a lot of this is, is not for lack of effort. Sometimes it's, it's mind space and sometimes it's just calling it out. But I, I think you can make change pretty quickly. And Kristen, I want to so say it's all... Down. Go ahead. Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna say it's also really important to remember it's not just women and women of color who need to be asking for these things. Of that 10 to one ratio, the nine men who were there should have been saying something about, hey, I've noticed, you know, the NIH director called out no more mantles last year. I think it's really important that, and that's another way that you can have allyship. And when you talk about men being mentors and sponsors, you also have to look at those things with a critical eye and say, I'm speaking at this conference. Does it look like there's a good balance? So it shouldn't just just be the women or the women of color who are making these uh, these statements and who are reaching out to the conference organizers and making sure that that diverse population is represented. I, I would absolutely uh, well. Like unfortunately, our hour is coming to a close. We're down to the last two minutes, so I thought maybe I would summarize, you know, a few of the things that I heard, some of the learnings and call to action. I think you know we would encourage people, you know, seek mentors with a distinct experience that you're looking for and expertise, but also with a diverse background. Don't seek mentors that are just like you, or that will really not expand your horizon. And understand that the mentor-mentee relationship is a mutual one. You need to give as much as you're seeking to gain. Take the time and make the effort, put it on your to-do list to engage with your mentors regularly. As people said, it could be as simple as a test. Um, like I said, just yesterday, I got a couple rolls of duct tape from my mentee, and I can't tell you that meant a lot to me because I've been looking for those small rolls of duct tape unsuccessfully for a while. Um, ask for sponsorship. Ask people to put you out there if you think you are a candidate, and assume you are a candidate. Don't feel like you're not qualified. And then, you know, create mentorship and sponsorship opportunities. So with that, um, I'd like to thank all the panelists and the core team and all the people in the audience. I hope you found this useful. If you have additional questions, please send them to us. We can make sure they get to the panelists, and, and we hope this was a productive use of an hour of your day. Thank you all.